best mission last year, our most recent mission last year? Which one was that? Our most recent mission was Alaska. We left last July, filmed into mid-August, and shot a five-part series on our travels through all over Alaska. It was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was called Alaska, the Last Frontier. And it's like us going back. I hadn't been there in eight or nine years. I was able to bring my son there. It was awesome. And then that five-part series launched this last January. Awesome. How many people go on a trip like that? We have found that the magic number is three trucks, seven guys. And we can push to eight and we can drop as low as six, but there's something about three trucks, seven guys that has the perfect amount of workflow mm -hmm. without tripping on each other or being too lean in jobs. Yeah. And that's accounting for filmmaking. Now you could get by with less if you weren't making movies, but yeah. Filmmaking is its own job in itself. So we have two dedicated people typically just to do that part. Awesome. And then looking out this year, you got some exciting missions that you're working on. We do. Yeah. We've we're we're really working hard to get out of the United States, North America. We've been here a long time. COVID forced that on us. Uh, we had other plans. We've had, oh, I can't tell you how many other plans we've had to go other places, but through the, the COVID machine mm -hmm. and all that, um, it just hamstrung us really bad. So now, now that it's all lifted, we're getting out of here. So we're looking at three different seasons going forward and pretty much three different, hem well, two hemispheres, but from north to south to the equator. Crazy. Were you running into like all the like the vaccine mandate stuff? Yeah. Closing down a lot of trips. Yeah. Uh, Canada, we had big trips planned in Canada. Mm -hmm. As everybody knows there, the Canadian border lockdown, super tight. Yeah. Couldn't do anything there. So that forced us to pivot. Um, I mean, even last year when we went to Alaska, we didn't go through the Canadian border. We had to go the Alaska Maritime Highway. It was outrageously expensive to get our trucks up there. Yeah. But that's that's what we had to do to get to somewhere cool. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. So this year it's looking good. We're, we're, we'll hopefully be in the Northern Hemisphere uh, in the Europe region. And then uh, from there we've got other seasons planned, et cetera. But so far out that, as you know, they're just goals. Yeah. Right now. Who knows yeah. what the world will turn into yeah. between here and there. Yeah, a lot of different uncertainty points right now. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurship's crazy. I remember meeting you for the first time and you had just got done being in Africa and I had just got done being in Africa and I had a 96 Land Cruiser. And so I was asking around guys in town where I could get a grill guard for this thing. And they're like, oh, you should go talk to this Clay Croft guy. He's, he knows yeah. where grill guards are at. <laughs> And I remember going to your first shop and I didn't know you and you were upstairs fixing like the first drone I'd ever seen in my life. A huge one. Yeah. Cause you had just crashed it into a power line and you just bought it like that day. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I remember that crash in particular, man, that one hurt. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We, it was a Cine star eight back in the day. I mean, this is like, 2000 it's probably 2010 or something yeah. yeah yeah 12 or 13 because we did our first alaska trip in 13 uh yeah so say yeah 11 maybe that drone we built we wanted to have like cutting edge visuals yeah and so this new drone technology is going to be the ticket so we we went through a company and we ordered this Cine Star 8. We got it. We had to assemble everything. We had to solder boards and it took like brain surgeons to get this thing put together. We had to do, use Google Translate, the early Google Translate to translate from German to English to understand how to assemble it. It took yeah. us eight days <laughs> and we, we got this thing put together. And then it wasn't too long after that, I crashed it into that power line and you showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I remember you're like, this thing was expensive. And it I was. just crashed it. <laughs> oh, it was, I think at the time, I think we paid somewhere around like 
thirteen thousand dollars for that. You Insane. Know? And it does. It didn't do half or quarter of like what a Mavic Three does now. And it was huge, ginormous. Yeah. A lot of people were like, "Well, how come you carry this big trailer on your Alaska trip?" And it was because it, we needed this trailer to haul this drone because we had to have it in this. We built this special case and everything so that it could fit in there because it has to be fairly flight ready. And even then, we'd have it would take ten minutes to set it up to get it on the ground get it going for flight crazy and our flights were seven minutes long that's crazy where technology yeah. has come it's insane now that's like what we do primarily is fly drones heavily in our series yeah for hours on end so yeah i remember too and i on that first visit out to your first shop after we looked at the drone you were looking at headlamps and the different buttons on different headlamps and how some on off switches will go out earlier than others. And I was like, who is this guy who knows so much about on off switches of headlamps? <laughs> like, I've never even thought about that before. <laughs> Product testing and figuring out yeah. what's good. Yeah. yeah. So a lot has changed since, since those days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we are, we've reinvented this company almost every year in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, I'll bet it's gone through four major changes in the last 12 years of business. About every four years, three, four years, there's some revolution in cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID probably felt like a setback in a lot of ways, but it forced us to think differently. It forced us to reassess risk, mm -hmm. uh, to have better contingency planning, even though we still want to do high risky things. They're just much more thought out now because of what we learned through the trials of COVID. Um, and then we've also had to grow up a lot in our organization, our planning, the execution. And I think part of that comes from us getting older. We don't have like the endless energy that we used to. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have other commitments with family. Our kids are getting older and stuff. So it forces you to like, okay, we got to like refine this. We can't just throw our weight at it anymore. We've got to make this efficient and productive. Yeah. And that's been awesome. It has been hard. And I, I'm a guy that likes to wing it. Mm -hmm. I'm good at improvising. I like that. I get a little bit of a buzz out of that stuff. Yeah. So all of the strict organizations of the business and the formalities of things kind of drags on me mm -hmm. or used to, but now I'm actually seeing how valuable it is. And I'm like, man, I wish I'd have been smart enough to think this way. Yeah. Five, six, seven years ago, we would have been even further. That maturity. Yeah. You just got to get it beat into you sometimes. Yeah. The maturity. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Entrepreneurship is no joke. And like, I think the mental toughness it takes to get to where you are today is a, something that a lot of people don't realize. Like, like what you've done here is, is the American dream. It's like every guy's dream, like adventuring around in sweet trucks for a living. But I don't think, I don't think most people realize how hard it actually is. And like the, the stress and stuff you have to go through to, to get to this level. Yeah. The risks, pushing the chips in. We used to draw figurative lines across the tables and be like, all right, are you guys ready? We, we got to step across this line if we're going to do this trip. And if we don't, we'll either go broke, mm -hmm. I'll owe a bunch of people money or whatever. But if we do make it, we're going to hit the next level of our dreams. And I mean, it takes that level of commitment. And we did that over and over and over again. We used to, up until about three years ago, Shelly and I, about every Christmas, would sit down and be like, you want to do this again? You want to go again? Should we do this? You know, and then we evaluate it. And ultimately for us, it came down to like, yeah, we feel like we're called to do this. So we better, Yeah. you know. And, uh, but yeah, it took getting to that point every year and stepping across the line saying, I'm going to go through whatever is ahead of me. Um, we were under a very diff difficult still are in a lot of ways business model where we raise sponsorships every year 
There's about a four to six month ramp up for our plans, go raise the money, execute the mission. And then by the time you're finishing up the, the series of whatever you're doing, you're already two or three months into the fundraising for the next series. Mm -hmm. And that fiscal cycle, basically you raise all your money, run it out, raise all your money, run it out. And we did that for nine years. And so every year it felt like you were starting a new business. That's brutal. Brutal. Yeah. Brutal. But I learned a lot through that forging process of getting better at it and also learned that we don't want to do that anymore. So we're changing things. And you've been working with your wife since day one. Day one. And yep. how has that experience been? It has been awesome. I mean, I am so fortunate to say that it's been awesome because there's a lot of other people I know um, just from doing life over the last years that that's a really hard thing. And it is for us too, but we, it hasn't always been a walk in the park, but we, especially early on, we took a lot of, uh, we prioritized our marriage heavily. And then as we got started and things were really dynamic, fiscally, with the jobs, with the risk. And then we also had really young kids at the time. There's so much going on that we we actively went to counseling uh, once a week for three or four years straight. Crazy. Yeah. And <clears throat> the marriage was never in trouble. It was just, we, need, we knew right off the bat, because we have great mentors around us saying, hey, this is what you're doing is so dynamic and hard that if you don't maintain this, the rest of it's going to fall apart. Or at some point, you're ultimately going to have to pick, right? Yeah. You're going to either have to pick your marriage and drop your job, or you're going to have to pick your job and drop the marriage. Yeah. Well, that's not an option. Yeah. So we had to figure, I mean, it was, we got to figure this out right now. And uh, it was, oh, it's been the best thing ever, you know? Yeah. I would, I would encourage anybody, anybody who is married, period, to do counseling, because you're not as smart as you think you are, yeah. you know? You've probably got a lot of bit wrong and some people helping you out will really benefit you <laughs> yeah otherwise there's that slow fade scenario where yeah it's like you know the boiling in water where just things mm -hmm. start to build up over and over again yep so you just mentioned you think you were called to start and build exo what's what's the calling what are you what do you feel there the calling is to ultimately show the world that there's a different way to think and see and um, evaluate like your life choices and stuff. Adventure brings out a lot of self-refinement, self-improvement. There's a quote that says, you know, adventure introduces a man to himself. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we live in a very comfortable world and that comfort is detrimental to our growth. So adventure kicks you out. It exposes your weaknesses. We happen to do it through overland travel. We love to see the world and be self-sustained, self-reliable, all that stuff. There's other ways to do it. Hunting, um, is an, a backpacking. I mean, you name it. Yeah. You know. But the the act of being adventurous uh, is, I think, one of the best ways in the modern world to help us refine ourselves as people. Because that's kind of what's left. Yeah. Where else do you get it? Yeah. You know, our daily lives are pretty cush. Yeah. At least, you know, here, that's not the whole world, but. That's super interesting because Mountain Tough has always been the same way for me. It was 100% a calling. And like 100% since the beginning, it felt like it was God breathed, like doors open that shouldn't have opened all the time. Yep. And there was like, no other explanation than it was a calling and so i always wonder about entrepreneurs that don't have that and how hard that must be because of like the battles you have to go through but in the back of your mind when it's a calling it's like well there's no other al alternative i wouldn't do anything else right me too yeah like it's a kind of a reckless abandonment that's backed by calling mm -hmm. You know, and if if you have the faith that God's with you, then no one can be against you. Mm -hmm. And you know, you fret about all these business decisions and these risks and stuff. That doesn't mean that you can be flippant and just do whatever. I mean, 
I believe God gave us a brain and other yeah. people around us for a reason. <laughs> yeah. But it does give you that extra, uh, I don't know, the backing that says, I'm, I'm willing to take this risk because the creator of the universe is my business partner, mm -hmm. you know, and then you, you'll go for it a little bit more. Yeah. And uh, man, we have seen just so much of that stuff too. We see it in our storytelling yeah. all the time. I used to worry about, um, man, what stories are we going to tell? How are we going to get this? We don't know the future. We're really, we're shooting in real time. I have seven weeks to shoot a 12 part series. What, you know, I know where I got to be here to here, but what are the stories in the middle? And then we, back in the day, we just started praying like, you know, Lord, go before us and prepare the way. We'll be ready. And stuff would just show and up. The most amazing things would come of it. And when we try to force a lot of the story, it was just, no, it's not working. Yeah. It's not working. It's not working. So it's that balance of preparedness and thinking through things, but then giving it up and yeah. letting life just happen. And that's it's hard. It's, it's hard. hard. Yeah. It is so hard, but it is so much fun. Too. Yeah. Yeah, waiting on the Lord's timing is so hard, but so awesome when it comes through. He's never early, but he's never late. Yeah. He may not be early, but he's never late. Is so true. So how are you balancing the family nowadays with the kids getting older and ingraining them into the business? Sure. Keeping them away from the business. What's going on there? Um we are integrating them as much as we can. We're trying to give them skills. Like our, my oldest son, Cyrus, uh, is going on 17 this July. He is editing fully. Like we're trying to give him those life skills that come with it. You can go edit anywhere you want. It's kind of like swinging a hammer. If you know how to edit, you can kind of always just pick yeah. up a job here and there no nowadays. matter what's going on nowadays. Yeah. Um, our we're keeping it within the interest level too. We don't ever want to force this on our kids. Like, Hey, you've got to be a part of the show or whatever. Uh, some of it's voluntold, but not, you know, a lot of it is like, do you have an interest in it? Uh, then we'll find a job for you. Uh, when it comes to family time though, we are that whole thing of balance, life balance and stuff. I don't, it doesn't work in the life of an entrepreneur necessarily. I mean, you can always strive for it and it's a worthy thing to strive for, but it's not really practical. Uh, so we have gone into this mentality of like really dedicated, intentional time. So we work very hard on family. We'll go do family trips and that's all we do. And we spend time together. And then I know that there might be another three weeks where I have to go do my job and I have to be very intentional there. <laughs> But it's okay because we were just extremely intentional over here. We know that and we're all up in communications with how what's happening in our lives. And it seems to be working. Is it perfect? No, but it seems to be building the best relationships possible while having to do what we got to do. And then now I'm trying to bring like my oldest son and boys along if I can, because I don't think there's anything better than traveling the world to shape you as a young person. Yeah. And going to work with your dad is like the coolest thing ever when you're young. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, my family's from, all from ranching the world, uh, the ranching world. And, you know, you grow up working on the farm or grow up ranching, grow up ranching, and doing all this stuff, working together. And then my dad was a truck driver as well. And I went with him. He was gone yeah. all but three nights a week. But any chance I got, I was with him in the truck. Mm -hmm. And I saw him do business, interact with people. And that time was so intentional. So I actually get, I guess you could say I had it role modeled for me through my dad, even though he had to be gone a lot when I was with him, it was dedicated time. I'm working on you and us. And then when he was gone, it was okay. Yeah. I think that's like one of the greatest things we could do right now. Uh, we're homeschooling our girls. Mm, cool. And so they they can be around mountain tough all the time in the gym, clean in the gym. Um, but I think, I look at them now and I think about most days, the stuff that they're learning around mountain tough is going to help them more in life than a lot of the stuff they're learning in school. Cause it, think about the stuff that's helped me in my career. It's like those people sk skills, those problem solving skills. 
that real world stuff goes a long ways. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, I've, if I look back on what I learned in school and what it's applying to me now, I'm sure there's things that I just like not registering, but it seems like almost everything that I do now wasn't what I learned in school. It was what I learned with my dad being out and about. And they say like I've, the numbers, like you learn 70%, 70% of what you learn is observed. Yeah. 30 or 40 percent is taught. Yeah. So putting ourselves in positions where you can observe a ton of things versus like structured classrooms. I I if I could go back, I think homeschool would be a really awesome option mm -hmm. for us in the if I could have reworked it some way. I think yeah. that's really cool because of that observation level. Yeah. Yeah, especially for you, because you could do school out of trucks anywhere in the world. Yep. Do you, do you feel like do you feel like you could work and have worked on EXO like 24 hours a day, 7 days a week? 100%. And I think I think about EXO 20 hours a day. Yeah. You know, I dream about EXO and how to build it and stuff um to the point that it's if I've really had to try and let my brain breathe a little bit because I can think about it so much because it's such a diverse company and like to, to actually make it work is so dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, but learning to step away has been a really big struggle for me because I could be in it every day working on it. But I found that if I do step away from it, I actually do much better. So I'm learning to strengthen that muscle. Yeah. It's still pretty weak, I'd say though. When you step away, what do you do? Uh, I usually go out to the ranch. I usually have a rifle in my hand and I'm sitting on some hill on the prairie, you know, and points of reflection. I like high points. Um, and things, nature is big for me. Back in the day, I was backpacking and mountaineering. Places like that, I really gained the most bang for the buck on resetting. Um, even over like trips to Hawaii or Mexico or things like that. If I can just go sit on a hill. Yeah. Get away from everything. Get away. Phones off. Mm -hmm. Do you get some of your best ideas for the business once you do those resets? Yeah. And I usually, those best ideas are usually taking things off the plate. Cause when you're in it, you're like, next idea, next idea, let's do this, let's do that. And then all of a sudden, like, you've piled on a bunch of stuff that necessarily doesn't move the needle. It all sounds cool in the moment or, or maybe it does have legs, but you just can't get to it. So you got to prioritize and I can't prioritize unless I step away. Yeah. And then you get spread too thin. Yep. And I've got an amazing team of people here. They're all, yes, sir. Yeah. I, yeah. We can do it, but you got to preserve your team. You know, that's, that's awesome that your team is that way, but you can run them into the ground by, overloading them so we got to protect ourselves even though we're go-getters yeah we got to watch it <laughs> you know what have you learned about your team over the years and like what's worked what hasn't restructures uh whoa well, that's a great question formality is very important um roles people I grew up with the kind of a the cowboy mentality. Well, you just know what you should just know what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And you if if you got time to lean, you got time to clean and your hands should never be in your pockets. That has some value, but it's better if you could define roles mm -hmm. is what I've found. Implying or, or having that sense of uh I don't know, work entitlement and that everybody should have that too. Uh, it took me a while to realize that that was kind of messed up. Yeah. And because uh, it's the way I was raised. That's how that's how ranches work and it works. Yeah. But it's not how business works. Yeah. And uh, so I had to rethink some stuff. And so finding the roles, defining things, getting um, m measurable job descriptions, KPIs, key performance indicators, things like that, has uh, increased morale, increased productivity. Uh, everyone's having more fun, and we're getting more done. And I wish I'd known that a lot earlier. 
It's hard though. Oh, it's so much. It's so hard. You need, uh, I found, I mean, I think you could read a bunch of books and all that, but I th at the end of the day, you got to pull somebody in who's been through it. Yeah. You got to have mentorship yeah. in that stuff. And we, we pulled in an awesome mentor this year, uh, Steve Benzak, who's a former, one of the former um, executives of Ex Officio and yeah. to help us run and, and even tune up what we've got going on now after 12 years to tighten it up. And it's amazing the improvements that we're making even now. So yeah. you're never done with this process. Yeah. Uh, and then I think understanding uh, interpersonal dynamics, you see it on expeditions when you live a foot and a half from someone for six straight weeks, mm -hmm. building the right team with the right personality uh, compatibilities is also really important, especially in leadership. You know, you can't scale that, I think, to the highest level, like within massive corporations. You can, you can try, mm -hmm. but at least within your leadership team, um, hitting those proper interpersonal dynamics is key. And then building culture that everyone can align on. Yeah. Whew, that's when we started to see things move when we got there. Mm -hmm. That just took took me a long time to figure out. Yeah. Thank goodness I had a lot of uh, leadership training, leadership. I needed, one of the first things I ever did was the National Outdoor Leadership School, uh, Mountaineering School. And the, that's what I gained out of that experience. It wasn't how to climb a mountain. It was like how to understand your leadership style and it worked within teams. Yeah. And that was in 2000 that I started that. And here we are 22 years later. I'm still re referencing those <laughs> lessons and more and more on top of it every year. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that stuff's really hard. I'm a Montana kid also. And so it's always like you figure it out yourself. You do it yourself. You don't take anyone else's money. You find your own money. Yep. And in the business world, that has been really, really challenging for me. But then you also wonder if like that mentality is what got you to where you're at today. So it's like those two dichotomies are always fighting each other. Yeah. There's a, uh, I think he was in marriage counseling at some point. Our counselor said, we were talking about some sort of relational dynamic and he said, well, if that's, if that's what you think it is, or you've been raised a certain way or, uh, and you've kind of made yourself a promise or you told yourself, this is the way it is. Well, you can always ask yourself, is it still working for you? Mm -hmm. Is it still working for you? <laughs> you know? And then I'm like, well, well, I'm just doing it because that's what I was told it the way it is. And yeah. you're right. You know, if I think about it, it isn't really working for me anymore. So yeah. maybe there is another angle that I should look at. And a lot of times for me, it's ego. There's some ego involved there. Um, I want to do it my way and finding more and more that I want more smart. I want smarter people in the room than me. Yeah. Because I kind of beat my head on the wall a lot. Yeah. People with more business acumen than we have. Yeah. Yeah, I saw our ranch uh, 20, 2008. My grandfather was uh, getting pretty sick and he had ran the ranch for years and uh, he was pretty tight-lipped about everything. And uh, he, did, he, he was successful in what he did. He built, well, I think at the time, one of the times in history, it was the second largest ranch in Montana. So he, he knew what he was doing, uh, but it was failing at this point. And the family had to come to a, dis a point where we said, okay, we have to reevaluate this. The leadership is in a way not working anymore because he's just getting old. We need help. And we brought in this board of people and uh, in one year turned the company around 420%. And it was, a, and they let us kids come in and watch that process be a part. We couldn't say anything, but we could sit in the room. And I watched my family go through that process of reinventing the ranch, getting away from old ways, listening to mentorship and, um, you know, high level guys that were expensive, but they came in and they said, this is what you got to do. And then you got to make some hard decisions. Like they had to cut the horse program. That was like what the ranch was known for. They had to kill it. Crazy. But because they did it and they made those decisions, that ranch is thriving today. 
So I had a really good example when I was 20, 18, yeah. 19, 20 of that working. So yeah. thank goodness they let me in the room because it saved me 10 years later when I'm having to do the same thing in my own company. That's awesome. Yeah, otherwise as the leader, you can bottleneck the whole thing from going where you want it to go. Yeah. We all have blind spots and leadership has a lot of blind spots. Mm -hmm. I, I would talk to a team, I, I ask them all the time now, like, hey, I, I'm blind, I, I, I see this, I have vision for here but I can't see all of this. This is what you guys are for. Help me, you know, and I'll help you. Yeah. But we're looking out for each other. Do you feel like you have the, like the founder brain, big ideas, big vision, brand, yep. but not organization or structure? Yes. I'm creative. I'm an ADD kid. I love thinking two, three years down the line. I love seeing what the brand could be, mm -hmm. but if you ask me to like input details into a calendar, I die inside, <laughs> you know? And if you even ask me to look at a calendar and run off a calendar, I struggle. Yeah. I know I have to do that, but I'm not built to run that way. Yeah. <laughs> I've had to grow up a lot in that department. I get anxiety right before calendar meetings. It's like, just get super stressed like, out, uh, spreadsheets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on have you what is it the enneagram have you done any of the enneagram testing on i haven't done that one it's it's probably the best uh personality profiling that i've ever gone through and our whole team goes through it now too uh and i'm a seven so if you go look it up once once i learned that i was a seven on the enneagram and i read the description of it it read my mail Did i was it? like how in the world can this be this precise with who i am i felt like a little exposed yeah you know and then it goes through what you're like when you're a healthy seven and what it looks like when you're an unhealthy seven, when you're not operating in your skill sets properly. So it's been amazing. Check it out. That's sweet. Yeah. That's awesome. So what does your healthy seven look like? Healthy seven is, um, I know that I have a team of people that can, that are well organized and understand the vision well. That's my job. And then once that is taken, once that is in, operating condition good operating condition like it is now mm -hmm. that frees my mind and my responsibilities and the weight of being like a ceo visionary to thinking that way because there's always that battle of working in the business and working on the business uh i can get sucked into working on the business a bunch so or or, or in, in it in yeah it, uh, and i need to work on it so now with all of those like the structure in place there i'm thriving more and more in my my skill sets and my giftings of vision and brand and thinking ahead better because I know that this is taken care of, mm -hmm. the business backing. Um, so that, that involves stepping back more and more, being able to see the whole field, look further down the road, uh, take in the account of all of the variables that we know. And then essentially you just work with those because you can't really account for the unknown variable yeah. other than having a healthy team to take it on when it happens. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's thinking about creative next films, how to tell better stories, what would make the greater impact mm -hmm. for our audience and people yeah. at the end of the day, legacy. When you're on your deathbed and you look back at stuff, that sort of stuff, like did we do everything we could to leave the best world behind yeah. in my time? Uh, and are, are you seeing some of those life change? I'm sure you've seen them on trips with the folks with you. Um, and as well as your subscribers, your audience, people that have got into the overlanding lifestyle for the first time. Are you seeing those stories come in of like how adventure has changed their life, saved their life, saved their marriage, stuff like that? all the time we get we get emails instagram messages all the time mm -hmm. um, which is in a lot of ways very motivating uh it can't be the reason you do it exclusively yeah you gotta also have your own reasons but it really is uh humbling to read that it makes you realize okay you better keep your your world together because people are being impacted so you want to ho hopefully impact them the right way continuing forward, you know, yeah. do keep doing what you're doing. 
Um, but yeah, adventure, we're seeing it all the time. People recovering from things, uh, taking on new mindsets, something to work together on in marriage uh, or as families. It's a bonding thing. Uh, being able to go see the world changes you. It refines you. And I think I see a lot of people say, I didn't realize I could do it. I didn't realize that I was capable of these things because you put yourself in a vehicle and you go live out of it for a certain amount of time. It's like, it's pretty uh, invigorating and it enlightens you to your weaknesses because there's yeah. no one else making your decisions for you. You've got to think through the full process and you see people kind of wake up. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. 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 It's that wild at heart yep. adventure is in the heart of every man stuff. Mm -hmm. And now it can just transform their whole life. Mm -hmm. That was a big influential book for me back in the day. I need to read it again. It's been a long, long time. I yeah. wonder what I'd get out of it now, <laughs> you know, years later. Probably a lot. That yeah. book is excellent. It is. The Wild at Heart. Like, what is it? Every man needs an adventure to live and a beauty to rescue mm -hmm. and a battle to fight. And a battle to fight. Yeah. So true. If you can find those three things, and they're all in a healthy spot. Man, you've got it pretty much made. Yeah. You know, it's pretty cool. Well, I think that calling and that mission alignment around those three things, I think it gives you that fuel to kind of work on work on stuff like 24-7. So I look at Mountain Tough and very similar to you, it's been 24-7. I'm either working on it or thinking about it for six or seven years, mm -hmm. but it it's never been forced. The fuel has always been right there where never in my life has that been the experience. Like if you're going to work on something 24 seven for something you don't have a passion for, it's brutal. It's like, it takes everything you got. Mm. But when I think that calling is, is lined up, the feels almost always there to to do something it is a balance so that you you keep it healthy with your family but the like the ideas are always there the fuel is always there to to do a little more work on it agreed and i think it's a lot to do with that like an adventure to live in a battle to fight like <laughs> these businesses are doing cool things but they have big missions that that a lot of people don't see they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you can line up with their, at least with us, if you can line up with their non-financial goals, because the finances will always come, but if you can line up with people that believe in what you're doing and can back you up, uh, like I think, I just think through like all of our sponsor set, we always say that the people that we're working, we don't work with Toyotas or General Tires or whatever, we work with the people behind the desk at that, that is in charge of their marketing dollars, but believes in what we're doing. And uh, that also is getting the right people around you is critical because you can have all the greatest intentions and the drive and all that. But if you don't get the people around you, I think you will ultimately fail as well. Yeah. Got to surround yourself with the right people. Yeah. It takes a team. Yep. When did your faith, faith journey start? Early really early my five you know is when you could say i accepted christ mm -hmm. um and then my mom is a amazing like near i would say she's scholarly level biblical teacher uh so i was raised in that environment and uh she's phenomenal and then i wanted to talk to people and reach people from grade school on yeah you know i found international travel through a uh, crew uh wanted to travel the world and spread spread the gospel yeah. and uh, that was amazingly impactful for me and it even leads into what i do now i mean we're not actively spreading the gospel through xo but yeah. but uh, it still is in the back of my mind like how i operate and who i need to be who i want to be yeah and so it it was it was a family thing from being a kid early on. Yep. Did you guys go to church? We did. Yeah. 
uh, and I went through rocky churches. Yeah. I mean, I, I church to me has always been a, in my later years, like say like 25 on, I've really, really evaluated the, tr- the church mm. scenario. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, it was youth group was extremely important for me. Um, peer groups, mentorship, all that. That was the most significant thing. And then church was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I can say that I, because of the way I was raised and the churches that I went through, the church I went through, and how often it broke up and split and saw inner fighting, uh, that made me really evaluate like what church is. Yeah. And then once you go travel and you see Africa yeah. and you see Europe and you see all kinds of other ways of doing church and what that looks like and how, yeah. um, how healthy people are there too, it has shaped my perspectives on church a little different. Yeah. But it's still very valuable. It's hard to go back to church after being in Africa, man. Yes. That the kids at the the orphanage worshiping every single morning, every single night on their own was so overwhelming. And then to come back to American church is so hard. Yeah. It's tough. But at the end of the day, community is what it's about. Yeah. And so finding that community putting your surrounding yourself with the right people and uh, having grace with each other, you know, yeah, it gets you a long way. Yeah. Are you still doing uh, men's group type stuff, connecting with small groups of men? I haven't. I haven't in probably five or six years uh, on that level, which is probably, I would say, a hole in my life right now. Yeah. Um, other than that, uh, I think the people that I'm surrounding myself in with business, they're all kind of all on the same page. So it kind of almost becomes that, even though we're interacting on a business level, we're also really talking on a spiritual level often. Yeah. So I, I feel like I'm not totally left out to dry there, but yeah. you know, having guys like you and, and others in my life would be very much more beneficial going forward. Yeah, yeah. it's helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're kind of in the same boat where, I get so busy that that's the, like the men's group type stuff becomes a whole, which it shouldn't be. Yeah. But then you can kind of replace that with your team. Yeah. So you still, I mean, you still prioritize it. You still look at it. And I, I, this is that entrepreneurship side again, where like it'll, it never seems to line up perfect. It'll never be like this check the boxes thing yeah. because the world in the, which you and I operate in inside of entrepreneurship is so dynamic and changing all the time. And you have to be on your feet, ready to go to make it work. If you don't do that, then, uh, then it'll fail. Mm-hmm. So it's just part of what we're called to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So with everything that you've seen and done and been through, what are you telling the folks out there now that ask you or, you know they're out there that are they want to do their own thing they want to go down this entrepreneurial journey Mm. uh that if you were called to do it and this is who you're made up to be and you think it is kind of who you're i don't know built this is how you're built you should do it you need to do it get good people around you start reading some books and go for it uh failure is okay you're gonna lose friends along the way you're going to gain friends along the way. Um, you're going to lose money. You're going to make money. Um, and I would also say if you're 100% motivated or mostly motivated by money, you're probably not an entrepreneur. Um, money is just a byproduct of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs are thinking team, team-wise, brand-wise. Uh, money is okay. You got to make money. But I would say if that's your driving force that you should probably reevaluate that while you're getting into something. Unless you just love the mechanics of making money, mm-hmm. which is okay too. You know, but for the love of it is uh, you won't get very far. Yeah. You'll lose motivation pretty quick. I mean, if I look back on the 12 years of doing this, if I wanted to make money in any other way, I probably would have been on far better. Yeah. You know, or, or could have. Yeah. Who knows? But you got to love it. 
because you love it. Yeah. It's got to have the vision behind it. Yeah. And it's okay to change. If you, if you get somewhere and you're stuck and you realize it's not you, it's all right. Don't be so stuck in it that you, you burn into the ground, you know? Um, and then one of the best pieces of advice on the flip side of that to me is uh, most people quit just before they make it and don't quit just before you make it. Yeah. You can never quit on this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I always, I always say the same things, very similar things. And then I always add like one of the only things an entrepreneur has is time. It's all about time. And so I always tell folks, you got to like, if this is, if this is your idea and this has a vision and a calling behind it, you got to, you got to go now. Mm -hmm. Cause you don't want to be looking back at this vision four years from now and it still hasn't started yet. I mean, it, it's a daily thing. It's some one foot in front of the uh, the next, and it's it's God opening those doors, and so you got to just start. You got to go. Start. Yeah. Have you ever looked at your life as an investment opportunity? Have you ever th thought of it that way? I haven't. So, if you take like, you know, they say, if you invested five thousand dollars when you were twenty, by the time you're sixty-five, you'd have umpteen bazillion dollars, right? Mm -hmm of some kind, even if you just left it there. Well, I, I do believe that that is the same in our daily life too. Like if I was to start in investing into myself now and I don't wait, the real impact is later in my years because I started early here So true. because yeah. I went started there. So I'm, I don't want to sacrifice what I could be gaining at the end of my life if I make it that far uh, because I was too lazy or too scared or didn't think I had the resources or whatever to start down here. Mm -hmm. You're losing that impact at the end of your life, potentially. Yeah. Uh, so that that drives me forward too, and that has driven me into doing a lot of business decisions that some of them didn't work out, some of them cost money. I learned from all of them, uh, but I do think that it's all building towards my education to have the greatest amount of impact. Yeah. Towards the end of my life. Yeah. Hopefully. And you can't, <laughs> you can't fail if, if everything's a learning experience, which is awesome. Right. I mean, it's if everything you're just learning and learning and learning and don't view them as failures, man, that helps a ton too. Yeah. Learn from the sting of failure. You know, you don't like that feeling. So you'll make, you'll take the lessons learned, but you've already, if you can take it from there, you've already learned the lesson and you, you did come out with something very valuable, mm -hmm. even though it was painful. Yeah. 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 Well, awesome. I'm going to let, let you get back to your team. Thank but you. Sure. Appreciate it. Yeah. You bet. Anytime. You too. It's so cool to see how far Mountain Tough has come to. Uh, I love seeing like I was in the Shields the other day and I was like, you know, I was like, Dustin, <laughs> look at this. You got a booth. You know, I know what it takes to get, you know. Yeah space inside of those stores and stuff like that. I mean, you guys are hustling and pushing hard and good on you. It's been crazy. It's been a crazy journey. Um, but I'm so glad I did it and wouldn't do anything else. Well, here's to the future and here's to what's beyond further than we can see. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Yeah.